you know, I've written a new book, and not The Divine Reversal, that is my first book, but I've written a new book, and it's called Saving God, and it is all about freeing Abba, the Abba of Jesus, from captivity to religion. Thank you. And we have dressed up God in all kinds of doctrines and ideologies and ideas that are not who he is. And we justify that with proof texts throughout the Bible. And we love our little proof texting game. And I'll have people ask me all the time, well, what verse did you get that out of? And that lets me know right away where their heart is. Their heart is in needing a proof text. And the problem with proof texting is that there is a much bigger picture that has been painted by the gospel. And the picture painted by the gospel is a picture that includes all, that excludes none. It's a picture that is grace. It's a picture that is love. And you can find other things in the Bible. And so when you need a proof text, guess what? You're going to find one. We can find proof texts for the fact that hell is not real. We can find proof texts for the fact that people will be going to hell, thereby making it real. We can find proof texts for universalism, for evangelicalism, for Baptist, Presbyterian, Methodist, Lutheran, Catholic. Guess why there's so many denominations? Because there is a proof text to back each one. So what do we need to do then? Because when the Bible doesn't seem to line up in every area, a lot of times what we do is we play the explanation game. Okay, after we've played the proof text game, we begin to play the explanation game. And the explanation game goes a little like this. Well, you know, we don't understand fully what's being said there because of historical context, and I get it, okay? I do it. Sometimes we do need to explain stuff. But sometimes what we're doing is we're explaining stuff away because we don't want to deal with what it says. People don't want to deal with the Father judges no one. So what do they do? They begin to play the explanation game. Well, yes, but Jesus was saying, you know, that he's going to judge. Now, Jesus offered his judgment. Jesus' judgment looks a lot like this. Father, forgive them. Yes. T.F. Torrance says it this way. He says that in every act of judgment, there is an act of forgiveness. In every act of forgiveness, there is an act of judgment because you're judged in need of forgiveness. So when Jesus says, Father, forgive them, he has just judged humanity. Okay, so the Father judges no one, and we don't need to explain that away. He's not going to judge you. That's a simple response to that verse. And what we need to understand is that the God that we think that we know, no matter how good we feel God is, no matter how much education we have, no matter how many seminaries we've been to, no matter how many degrees we have, the God we think we know is absolutely nothing compared to the Father revealed by Jesus. John tells us that no man has seen God at any time. And then he goes on to say that the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has revealed him. So what does this mean? This means that Jesus is the litmus test that every revelation must pass. Every revelation. Okay, the revelation of men who stand up here and tell you that God is angry at you because of your sin must go through the revelation that Jesus has given about his Father. And what did Jesus give as a revelation about his Father in relationship to anger about sin? What did he say? Neither do I condemn you. Where are those accusers of yours? He doesn't say, hey, my father is your accuser. But this is how we've treated God. This is the father we've given to the world. And we wonder why people don't want any part of this divine child abuser. The world is running away from God at record pace because of Christians. It's not because of God. And we love our little pet doctrines, and we have them. Well, they're running away because they're afraid of the truth. No, they're running away because they're afraid of the dictator that you've given them. And you know what? I feel like in running away from that dictator, they're probably running full on into the arms of the Father. Many atheists have turned away from a false god directly to the heart of the real one. Because they say, look, that doesn't make any sense. But we don't care if it makes sense. We have our proof texts. I'm not even on my notes yet. (laughs) 
And so what we have to do is we have to look at the bigger picture that's painted by the gospel. We have to look at what is said by Jesus. You know, like I said, if we stand up here and we say, oh, God hates you because you're gay. I love Brad Jersick's answer to that. Well, let's go see what Jesus says about that. There's a subject he never deals with, ever. Okay? He loves everyone. So guess what happens? That revelation does not pass the revelation of Jesus. Okay? So we can throw that out. But what happens when we read, say, in 2 Thessalonians, that God is going to judge people with flaming fire and vengeance? And we say, see, there it is. But Jesus said the Father judges no one. So who are you going to give preference to, the writer of 2 Thessalonians or the Son of God? And I'm not saying black that out of your Bible. I'm not saying throw it out. I'm saying shelve it because we just don't get what it means yet. Okay? There are some things that I, <laughs> I have blacked out in my mind that, look, I, it doesn't match Jesus. I don't care. It doesn't bother me that I can't explain some verse about judgment when I have the words of the Son of God saying the Father judges no one. Could it be that Paul's eschatology changed as he grew? Probably. Could it be that he was not, in fact, perfect yet? Maybe. Could it be that his doctrine grew? Could it be that he ran into John's community in Ephesus and said, oh, wow, these guys understand that God is love. I need that. Probably. I got that from a friend. I'll give him credit for it. Thanks, Michael. (laughs) So then how do we evaluate the Father? You know, if we will just give preference to Christ, I think things will start to line up. If we'll stop playing the proof text game and stop giving preference to our favorite verses that talk about exclusion or that talk about flaming fire or that talk about this, that, or the other thing and give preference to Christ and allow him to be what he is, which is the high point of all human history and the expressed image of the invisible God and the one who only does what he sees the Father do, the one who only says what he hears the Father say, then I think all of this stuff will start making sense. And so what I want to do today, and some of you have heard some of these stories before, but this is, I'm really just kind of preaching out of my new book. I want to tell you three stories that have happened in my life that have radically changed my beliefs. And my theology over the last six years has turned completely on its head. I remember someone coming to me six years ago, six, six, seven years ago, when, when Rob Bell's book, Love Wins, came out, and they said, you know, have you heard about this guy? I said, well, yeah, I know his NUMA videos. They're great videos. And, well, he's written this new book. It's called Love Wins, and basically the book is saying nobody goes to hell. What do you think about that? And number one, that's a false commentary on the book because that isn't what the book is saying, but I only learned that after I read it. And I love what Bell says about that. I always, he, he talks about what he believes, and then he says, I also feel it's only right to comment on books you've actually read. <laughs> but the book came out, and I was, I was forced to kind of evaluate some things. I said, okay. And so I started looking into things, and guess what? My theology has been turned completely on its head. That needs to happen with all of us. We need to reevaluate our theology. We need to not be stuck. At the moment you stop growing, you're dying. Physically, spiritually, emotionally, if you're not growing, you're dying. Okay, this is a law of life. (laughs) And having kids, being a father, will absolutely demolish your theology. (laughs) In many ways. (laughs) It will demolish everything you thought you knew about being a parent. It's pretty easy to stand when when you're not a parent. It's easy to look at people who have kids and be like, well, I wouldn't act like that. (laughs) I remember Gabby and I discussing politely with each other before Dylan was born the necessity of a changing table in the, in the nursery. And I just said, you're not going to run upstairs every time to change his diaper. Yes, I will. I'm not going to change him on the couch. <laughs> and then we had Dylan, and what happened? Nearly every time she changed him on the couch. 
Having kids ruins what you think you know. Having my kids will ruin even more than most people's. <laughs> Knowledge, I mean. Kind of scrambles your brain. You know, I had always wanted to be a dad. When I, I had a great dad. For those of you who didn't have great dads, I'm sorry. The father wants to fill that role. For those of you who had amazing fathers, guess what? They're an image of him. And they only are what they are because he is what he is. Okay, and so this doesn't need to be a day that people get depressed. Oh, I had a bad dad. Well, you know what? You've got a good one. Well, I had a great dad. Awesome. He's an image of a better one. And when I first started having kids, you know, I, I, they just consume my world. You have a baby and you look at him and you're like, I could never love anything this much. And you have another one and you're like, I could never love anything this much. And it just keeps growing each time. And when Aiden was just starting to crawl, that one, when he was just starting to crawl, we, I was sitting upstairs in my house, and he began to crawl towards the edge of the stairs where we had a gate making it so that he couldn't crawl down the stairs. And I was just sitting there. I wasn't even doing anything spiritual. I think I was just hanging out, I was probably eating a Twinkie. <laughs> that was when I used to be bigger. And the Father spoke in very clearly, and, you know, very rarely does God speak to me in a way, you know, I usually just get like a picture or a vision, or, and this was a very clear conversation. And he said, if there was no gate to block his fall, would you wait for him to cry out to you before you saved him? And I said, no, I wouldn't. He said, do you think you're a better father than I am? And that began to stir something in me. And, you know, we have this, this idea of free will. And it's largely a Western idea because we value our freedom. You know, in countries that don't have the kind of freedoms that Americans have, the idea of free will is kind of distant. Um, but we have this idea that we have free will that, oh, well, you know, God has given us all this stuff and then he's given us free will and that then now what we must do is use our free will to outwill him because our will is more powerful than the one who is omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent, but our will can trump his. <laughs> and I don't think we realize what we're saying. Is God omnipotent? Okay. Or is our will omnipotent? Because we can't have both. We discount who we say God is when we insist upon this, okay? And does this mean that we're not autonomous? Does this mean that we're just robots, that we walk around and we're controlled and every move is controlled? No. Okay, free will means, look, the very definition of free will means uninfluenced by outside sources. Is there anything that we have ever done that was uninfluenced by outside sources? No. You know, when, if you were here for the conference, you heard Andre talking about we are a people that reflect. Okay? It's mimetic. What we do is we mimic what we see. When we're teaching a baby to speak, mama, 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 and they finally go, mama. <laughs> he's talking. No, he's imitating. <laughs> dada, 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 mama. No. <laughs> So when we look at our kids and we, why are you talking like that? Hmm, guess why? <laughs> guess why Dylan says stop it all the time because we tell him stop it. <laughs> he Stop it, Austin. Stop it, Austin. And we say stop it, Dylan. Stop saying stop it. Stop it. <laughs> and why kids think it's so funny to play the copy game. And they copy everything you say until you just want to, ah. And then they go, ah. <laughs> Because this is who we are. We reflect what we see. We imitate. We mimic. Okay? So what does this mean about free will? That there really is no such thing as free will in the way that we've described it. That our so-called free will is really an imitation of someone else's imitation of someone else, imitation of someone else. 
And when we make a decision to follow Jesus, what have we done? We have imitated the man up front who has pulled at our heartstrings and tugged us and said the right words so that we are either afraid enough, moved enough, or crying bad enough that we want to come forward. Those are not free will decisions. You have been acted upon by something else from the outside. Does that make it wrong or bad or evil or no? It doesn't discount it. It doesn't, it, but what it does do is it says, look, free will as we have taught it is a myth. When we are kids, we have absolutely no free will. When we are parents, we have no free will. And so what we need to understand is in this realm of will, in this realm of authority, what have we been given? Psalm says, the heavens are the heavens of the Lord, but the earth he has given to the sons of men. Correct? So what does that mean for us? The heavens are the heavens of the Lord. The eternal realm belongs to God. The eternal realm is under his command, under his free will, under his authority. And the earth he has given to the sons of men, that means that this mortal realm, this earth realm that, you know, dad teaches on dominion all the time. This is in our command. You know, God demonstrated his commitment to leaving authority on earth in the hands of man in the incarnation. Because what does he do? He becomes a man. Could God have fixed the problem as a deity? Could he have stepped in without flesh and just rendered the, the situation over? Yeah. Why didn't he? Because he had given authority on earth to men, to people. And he was committed to that. And so he kept the authority in the hands of man by becoming a man and solving the issue once and for all as a man. And the reason we see miracles, I believe, from time to time, and the reason we're not really accessing things the right way is I think that from time to time, you know, we live between these two realms. We have this eternal realm, and then we have this speck of a mortal realm. And I think from time to time, and I think this is where Jesus lived because he's holy God and holy man, and so he's walking the line between the two realms. And why is he able to work miracles? Because he's accessing what he needs from each realm every time. And when we see a miracle happen, what happens? Well, we've straddled that line again for a second. But then what do we do? We build a little township there and we build a church and this is the first church of the spit in your eyes healing. <laughs> and we stay there and we quit walking. Faith is a journey, not a destination. And as we keep walking through this, from time to time, we're going to straddle that eternal realm again, and something's going to happen. And look, <laughs> if I could tell you how to do that every time, there wouldn't only be 40 people here today. We wouldn't be able to contain the people. And anyone who tries to tell you, I have the answer to healing, is a liar. That's like trying to say, I've figured this golf game out. <laughs> Lloyd, will you ever figure out golf? <laughs> No, it ain't going to happen. You're never going to just figure out this healing thing. Because the moment you think you've got it figured out, all you've done is created a formula, and that formula is going to do one of two things. It's going to exclude you, or it's going to exclude the person that's being ministered to. And when someone dies after you've prayed for them, your formula doesn't mean jack. You know what it means? that you weren't tapping into things at that moment, and that's okay. We need to learn to be okay with our failures just as much as our successes. We train our kids and we say, oh, you got to be a good sport when you win and when you lose, but then we get into the church and we effectively lose, and, and don't hear that wrong, but we effectively lose and someone doesn't get healed, and all of a sudden, oh, well, you know, they just didn't have enough faith. There was unbelief around them. They wanted to go. And we have 900 excuses as to why they didn't get healed. Guess what? might just be that they didn't get healed. And we got to be okay with that. We got to quit trying to play the explain it away game because you know what? People are tired of being promised things that we can't back up. And it hurts and it sucks. And the best thing that we can do is suffer right along with them. We can come alongside them and we can weep with them and we can cry with them and we can take their pain on and we can feel it and we can say, man, I have no answers for this. Or we can play the religious, 
Western evangelical game of, well, here's the answer. I have an answer to everything. I don't got an answer to why things don't work sometimes. They just don't. But it's not our free will that caused the problem. That person didn't will to go home. In this world, you will have tribulation is probably one of the least quoted promises of the Bible. But it's a promise. So in one child, <laughs> God ruined my theology of free will. Man, that was quick. All it took was one kid. And something that religion had tried to build into me for so many years was just... No, I wouldn't wait for my child to cry out to me before I saved him. God didn't wait for our cry. None of us were alive when Jesus died. He didn't wait for our cry to send Jesus to do what he did. He didn't wait for our confession for Jesus to hang on the cross and do like Paul said, die as all. And he didn't wait for our belief to raise as all. And he didn't wait for our prayer or our free will decision to ascend as all to the right hand of the Father where you are now seated with him in heavenly places. That was of no choosing of yours. That was of his choice. You know why? Because that's his realm of authority. That is not our realm. The next one came when my kids were a little older and Aiden Austin and Avery are outside riding their bikes and, you know, Austin has this ability to test his poor musician dad by singing things like Justin Bieber and Selena Gomez and all this music that there's no way I would ever approve of. And he's there singing, If I Was Your Boyfriend, <laughs> going up and down the street. Uh, I'm like, who are you singing this to? There's only guys out here. But they're out with some other kids, and they're singing and riding their bikes. And I'm, I think I was sitting on the front porch just relaxing. And again, I heard God speak. And this time it was if a truck came barreling down the road, would you wait for their cry in order to save them? And I said, no. And he said, would you push them out of the way even if it meant great personal harm to yourself? No. And he said, would you allow one of your kids to be hit to save one of the other kids? I said, no. And then again he said, you think you're better than I am? You know, this is a question that Jesus revealed to people around him all the time. Do you think you're a better dad than my dad? Who among you, if your son asks for bread, would give him a stone? Or if he asks for an egg, would give him a serpent? And you think you're a better father than my father? What's he revealing? The best of you, the best father among you is no match to the father that my father is. And again, I had to put my beliefs under examination because we have this idea that Jesus was sent to absorb the wrath of God, that God's anger was kindled with fire towards humanity, and that it was only Jesus stepping in as this firewall that kept God's wrath from being just poured out on the earth like lava. And that now the only thing that holds God at bay is Jesus' blood Really what we've done is we've created a Dracula in the sky that needs blood to be satisfied. And we don't have time to get into all of it, but we need to understand that when Psalms and then it is echoed in Hebrews says, sacrifice and offering you did not desire. They understood what the heart of the Father was. God did not need sacrifice to be appeased. He did not need blood to to not count our sins against us. Jesus did not come to appease a bloodthirsty God and as Jeff Turner says, feed him an Anselmian snack.
There are a number, you can't just give one reason why Jesus came. There are a number of reasons, but the majority of the reasons have to do with things like adoption and revealing our identity, showing us who we are, showing us who we were created to be, recreating humanity. Guess why he could do that? He had the authority because he was there in the beginning, breathing into Adam. And so he says, you know what? I'm going to take that breath back. I'm going to expel it on the cross, and I'm going to recreate this whole thing. And we have this idea in, in you know, the, the Western church and the evangelical church, and I say Western church because it, it really is not an understanding in the Eastern church. The, the idea is not that God killed God to appease God. Okay, and the idea is penal substitution, and what we have is we have this God who is so angered at sin that he must once in a while vent his wrath on humanity. And when he vents his wrath, things happen. And so Jesus comes in and he says, no, look, I'm going to absorb this wrath to appease God's destructive, judgmental nature. And I'm going to be forsaken by God. I'm going to be abandoned by my father, the one I've been telling you is better than any father. It doesn't make sense with the father that Jesus has revealed. I will never leave you nor forsake you applies to the cross. Just as much as it applies to you post-cross. And in the psalm, it says, a broken heart and a contrite spirit you will not deny. The words mean the one with a broken heart you will not turn your back on. This idea that God turned from Jesus, that he was so disgusted by his son that he turned from him, is straight from the pit of hell. A father would never be disgusted with their son and turn themselves away. Some biological parents might, but a father wouldn't. Especially one that is called the greatest father. Especially one that is inside the one who is dying. How can he turn away when he's inside? God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses against them. What does that mean for Jesus? Was he a part of the world? Yes. So what does that mean for God's wrath being poured out on sin? Wait a second. Jesus is a part of what God is not imputing trespasses to. So that means his wrath isn't being poured out on sin. Is sin being dealt with in the flesh of Christ? Yeah. How is it being dealt with? We are unleashing it upon him. And we're given, and he is willfully receiving all of our sin as we give it to him. And we feed him all of our murder and all of our hatred and all of our scapegoating and all of our guilt and all of our incest and all of our lust and all of our shame, and we just feed it to him. And he takes it and he heals it. Because this is how Christ works he takes our problem and he heals it and he gives it back to us whole and new. And he says, here, it's no longer a problem. Now it's a solution. And so we have this (laughs) bloodlust that circulates. And again, people stand on the outside and they look at us and, and we say things like, are you washed in the blood? And they go, gross. Well, are you under the blood, brother? And they're like, no. I don't want to be. I don't even like violent movies. So now with two situations, God God has utterly ruined my theology of free will and atonement. I mean, good grief. All it took was a couple kids. I didn't have to go to seminary. Now I'm doing it anyways. (laughs) 
Why? Because I'm a glutton for punishment. I think everybody would, would do well to learn some church history. We would start to realize, and this is what I'm learning in school, we start to realize much of what we believe is not as ancient as we think it is. Oh, well, the disciples obviously believe this. Eh, try 1800. Inerrancy, recent, very, very recent belief. The guys that people always want to quote, and I'm off topic, but the guys that people always want to quote about inerrancy, Martin Luther, John Calvin, Zwingle. None of them included revelation in their canon. You can't believe in inerrancy if you don't do that. Martin Luther drank so much that he changed the start time of his church services on Sunday to suit his hangovers. That's free. That has nothing to do with anything. He was German. <laughs> we would do well to learn it, though, because we would start to realize, wait a second, some of what we believe is not very old. It's modern belief post-enlightenment belief, post-mechanical age belief, and we've, we've come to, we are now smarter. And so now that we are smarter, we think that God pushes his son in front of the bus and throws him under the bus so that we don't have to have fire poured out on us. Really? I was talking about this with a friend, and I just said, look, this is like me taking one of my kids and disciplining them for another and my kids were in the back seat and they were listening and I got off the phone and I think it was Austin asked me, Dad, what were you talking about? And I just said, oh, you know, some people believe that, that God, God killed Jesus so that he didn't have to kill us. And he was like, what? He said, that'd be like you spanking me if Avery did something wrong. Duh. And kids get it like that and then we spend the rest of their lives training them that that is wrong. It's no wonder Jesus wanted the children to come to him. They got it. They got what he was about. Oh, you like me? Cool. Adults are like, you like me? Why? I have this and this and this. Or you, you know, I, have, I know why you like me. I have this. We always want to justify everything. And kids are like, okay. <laughs> the last story happened when Dylan was born. I was holding him just minutes after he was born and looking at him. And you know how you, parents, you know how you look at your baby when you're holding them and it's just like everything else goes dark and it's white noise and all you can, it's just baby. And I was holding him and then the father started talking and I was like, shh. And he said, is your son separated from you by default? Or is he by default a part of your family? Would you go put him on your front porch until he was old enough to cry out your name and then let him in the house? I said, no, and you don't need to ask the next question. You think you're a better father than I am? And this is how we treat people. We tell the world, you are separated, you are lost, you are not valuable. For God so loved the world gets turned into... For God so hate you because of your sin that he gave you an opportunity at reconciliation. He didn't give you reconciliation. He gave you an opportunity at being reconciled if you follow the right formulas and use your free will to exercise a decision so that you can now be reconciled. No. <laughs> we are not born by default separate from the Father. If he is the one in and through and by and for whom all things were made and through in whom all things exist and consist, and if he is our makeup, then if he withdraws, we cease to exist. It's like that movie with, I don't remember the name of it, with Bruce Willis when they're surrogates. Anybody ever seen that? 
Okay, they have these clones that they've created, and they sit at home, and their surrogates go around and do all their work. And then if they get hit, they just get another one. Okay? Well, there's a scene in the movie where the guy unplugs, and all the surrogates just go, and they all fall. This is what happens if God is not intimately connected in each and every life on this earth. It all falls apart. It is only here because he is in it. We are only breathing because the breath of life is in us. And the breath of life comes from who? Jesus, the Father, the Spirit, <laughs> the Godhead. This idea of an age of accountability, we pull this from one proof text in the Old Testament, and we form this entire doctrine out of the age of accountability to make our idea of separation more palatable so that when an infant dies in childbirth or during an abortion or, you know, God forbid the parents do something to the child or something happens and they're, well, at least they weren't at the age of accountability because that makes our idea of default separation more palatable. But what has that just done? That's just said, wait a second, people aren't separate by default. They're born reconciled by default because if there is an age of accountability, then what happens? At that age, okay, then you can separate yourself. So that means for this period of time, there was a mother in Florida recently who drowned her kids. And when they questioned her about it, she said, I didn't want my children to get to the age of accountability and deny Jesus, so I sent them to heaven. At least she's honest about her theology. We would never be so bold as to be so honest that that really is what we're preaching. Because we preach, oh, well, yeah, they're good until here. And we have special grace for that, and we have special grace for the mentally ill. But God is not a respecter of persons. So either our special grace is a myth or our hearts are betraying us, which is what I feel. Our hearts will betray us. All of our doctrine goes out the window when a baby dies. Everyone's a universalist at an infant funeral. They're in heaven. They're with the Father. You know why? Because we cannot stomach the idea of an infant who had no choice not being with the Father. Paul Young, the guy that wrote the shack, says, if your theology has left you in a place where you are kinder, gentler, and more merciful than the God you believe in, it's time to reevaluate your theology. And we all need to do this because our hearts betray us. We start to realize, wait a second, I would give this person more grace than the God I believe gives them. Okay, well, your heart's just betrayed you. And you've just revealed that you believe that you are better than your God. Why would you worship a God that you're better than? It's time to let this stuff get turned on its head. It's time to throw out the crap. It's time to throw out all the beliefs that we hold that are <laughs> blasphemy to the Father that Jesus has given us. We could go as far as to say that any God that we worship that does not look like the God of Jesus is an idol. And we are therefore worshiping an idol. And we are in idolatry. We might be coming to church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday and singing songs to God and, oh, thank you for killing your son for me, God, so that I don't have to take your wrath. And thank you, Jesus, for being my firewall. And we're in idolatry. You should have no other gods before me. I mean, come on, it's one of the ten. We want the Ten Commandments to stay in schools, and we want the Ten Commandments to stay in, on the court lawns, and we all lobby for this stuff, and then we come to church and we violate it by having another God before the Father that Jesus revealed. If it doesn't look like the Father of Jesus, it is not God. How do we, how do we measure that? 
Okay, well, we look, at the, we look at the revelation Jesus has given, but even more than that, we look at who Jesus was. And there's a lot of, maybe not with you, but there's a lot of speculation. Oh, well, did Jesus even really exist? And there's a guy that I read, and he is a agnostic with a vendetta, but he raises a lot of good questions. And he has a book out called How Jesus Became God. And he questions everything, and it's largely a lot of bad information and trash. But look, we have Testament. We have, you know, not just the four Gospels. We have other Gospels that didn't make it into the Bible. They all testify to the same ideas about Christ, okay, that he revealed a God of love. That's the, that's the heart of his message. And there might be some historical inaccuracies and there might be some things that don't necessarily line up and the dating in John doesn't line up with all the dating in the other Gospels and, you know, the, the sequence of the Last Supper doesn't line up with the sequence of the other Gospels. The one from John doesn't line up with the synoptics. And so you have, you have some discrepancies there. Oh, well, we can't trust it because we have this mimetic need for perfection because we demand perfection of ourselves and so therefore we need perfection in our text. But the point is that Jesus revealed a God of love. He revealed a father who is better than any father that has ever walked this earth or ever will. So everything we believe, I think we need to sit down sometime and we need to write out our doctrine. Make columns, make a checklist. Here's what I believe about God. Here's what Jesus says about his father. Does this line up? God is love. Check. The father judges no one. Check. God hates the sinners. Eh. What did Jesus do with sinners? Pretty sure he ate dinner with them. What does eating dinner mean in Jewish society? I'm willing to call you family. I'm willing to give you all that I am and all that I have. Not if you change as you are now. And we've built our empires around changing sinners. And Jesus says, that's not my father. I feel like for the last 2,000 years, Christ has probably been seated at the right hand of the father going, why don't they get it? You are love. Paul said it. John said it. I said it. Why don't they get it? And Paul and John are like, nah, they're people. <laughs> it's time we lay our idols down. It's time we lay down these false beliefs of God. The reason I called the book Saving God is because people are rejecting God because of what we've preached. They're not rejecting God because they experienced him and don't like it. That ain't possible. Paul said that beholding is becoming. When you've experienced God, you can't help it. You become everything that he is. They're rejecting the idols that we've presented to them, whatever they may be. Here's your bloodthirsty idol. Here's your I need all of your money idol. <clears throat> I do need all of your money. Here's... <laughs> Here's your fulfill my 12 steps to personal growth idol. Here's your free will idol. Look, and in this realm of sovereignty and free will, and look, sovereignty doesn't say I control everything that happens to you. It says I know the end from the beginning, and from the beginning I said it is good. That's sovereignty. Could God have said it is good if there was any part of it that was, in fact, bad? No, because that makes him a liar. You're going to get out of here early today. Let's pray. <laughs>